When a 12-year-old boy is found hanging by his neck in his family's backyard, the police quickly call it a suicide. But the unexplainable facts about this case have many wondering if there's more to this story. His family thinks this is murder, and they won't rest until they find the person responsible. Thanks for watching True Crime Recaps, I'm Chris. Wouldn't you agree that no mother should ever have to wonder what happened to her son? Sadly, that's been Ramona Rivas' life since April 14th, 2022. Ramona and her husband, Jared Daughtry, are lieutenant colonels in the U.S. Air Force. They lived on Sandalwood Lane in an upscale neighborhood in Yorktown, Virginia. They shared the home with Ramona's 79-year-old mother, Vija, their 16-year-old daughter, Maria, and their 12-year-old son, Sean, and Sean's half-brothers, who were five and two. Their community is only a few hundred people strong, but they're part of Greater York County, home to about 66,000, and patrolled by the York Pocosin Sheriff's Office. Spirits ran high in the Daughtry Rivas home. They'd just returned from a Disney cruise over spring break. Little Sean had the time of his life. He was so excited that on April 12th, just two days before she would find him dead, Ramona took her son to renew his passport so they could book another trip for August. According to Ramona, the trip was a reward for the kids. Maria and Sean were straight A students. Their teachers spoke highly of them, especially Sean. He was a happy kid, always excited. He was a talented musician and loved to play video games. But chores and homework always came first. Thursday, April 14th, 2022 was a typical day on Sandalwood Lane. Sean got off the bus around 3.02 p.m. and caught Grandma Vija leaving the house. Ramona was taking her to a doctor's appointment. Sean was in charge of watching his two-year-old brother. Jared was with their middle son in Williamsburg about 35 to 40 minutes away. The five-year-old had his own doctor's appointment. Meanwhile, Maria had an after-school tennis match and was due home a little after 4.30. Sean didn't mind watching his brother. In fact, he enjoyed it. He also looked forward to playing Fortnite with his friends, but only after doing his chores and homework. Like I said, this was a typical kid in a typical family. At 3.09, Sean turned in his online homework assignments with an attached selfie. He was still in the shirt and shorts he wore to school, an important fact that'll come up later. At 3.27, Ramona called Sean and suggested he bring his little brother upstairs so he could watch Sean play video games. Sean obliged, and he set his brother up with an iPad on the second floor. It's believed that around 3.30, Sean's alarm went off, reminding him to take the trash out. He hustled downstairs and fixed himself a quick snack before doing the garbage. He poured some jarred peaches into a bowl, then gathered trash from around the house. According to the family, this is where they lose track of Sean. His sister Maria got home shortly after 4.45 p.m. She was rushing to change since her boyfriend, AJ, and his mother were picking her up for AJ's lacrosse game. But the front door was locked when she got there. She rang the doorbell, but Sean didn't answer. She called and texted him over and over. Nothing. Then she called Ramona and said Sean wouldn't answer the door. Her mother insisted he was gaming upstairs and simply couldn't hear her. Frustrated, Maria hustled around back to try the rear door. That's when she saw someone in the backyard. Their back was turned. A string was tied around their neck and connected connected to the swing set. There was a black bag over their head and a belt holding their arms to their waist. Maria was rightfully scared. Was some sicko getting their kicks in her backyard? She called out, hey, no answer. As she got closer, her stomach sank. The hands and legs looked small, familiar even. It was Sean. His hands were discolored from the lack of circulation. He was barefoot with his knees bent and toes dragging on the ground. If he had wanted to stand and save himself, theoretically he could have. She hoisted him up to relieve the pressure and got the noose off his neck. She called 911 at 454 and the dispatcher walked her through CPR. EMTs showed up moments later. Meanwhile, Ramona was on her way home with Vija. Suddenly, swarms of ambulance and fire trucks zipped past her. She remembers thinking, please don't turn right. They did. She pulled up to find her house crawling with paramedics. Maria was hysterical. Ramona ran into the backyard to see EMTs trying to bring Sean back. His tiny body jumped up from the shock paddles. At at one point, an EMT screamed heartbeat, but it was faint and short-lived. Sean was dead. Ramona wanted to know why. Inside, Ramona found the two-year-old hiding under a pile of laundry on a chair. Sean's Crocs were thrown next to the trash that was never taken out. It was as if someone snatched him mid-chores. Neighbors came from every direction, yet nobody saw anything. One neighbor had security cameras with a view into Ramona's backyard. Unfortunately, they hadn't worked in years. There was a landscaper working in the yard next door around the time they believed Sean died, though he claims he never saw anything. It wasn't until Sean was 
was in the hospital that Ramona realized something was off. He was wearing Jared's clothes. Why on earth would Sean change into his stepfather's shirt and pants? The sheriff's office quickly ruled Sean's death a suicide. Reporters at Local News 3 got a hold of a document written by an ER doctor that said Sean had a history of suicidal ideations. However, the medical examiner said in their autopsy report that Sean had no known history of depression or suicidality. Still, they ruled Sean's death a suicide by hanging. His family refused to accept it. Over the next year, they'd fight tooth and nail with the sheriff's office to find out what really happened to their 12-year-old boy. They firmly believe he was murdered and they want to know who killed him. The family launched the What Happened to Sean campaign. Signs with the hashtag popped up around Yorktown and Greater York County. They started a Facebook page dedicated to sharing their side of the story. They also began a petition to have the case turned over to the FBI. The baffling details of Sean's case are impossible to ignore, so let's unpack each one, talking about what the family says and comparing it to the statements from the Sheriff's Department. Sean had a bag over his head and a belt holding his arms to his sides. According to the Facebook page, the belt was so tight EMTs had trouble removing it. The ME's report said a shoelace-type string was tied around Sean's neck with a silver-gray bag over his head. The bag in question was a motorcycle helmet bag that Jared had in the garage. He had several he planned on donating to Goodwill. The shoelace-type string was the drawstring from the bag. One bag was gone and another was missing its drawstring. It appears that whoever killed Sean thought they'd need both strings. But then again, Sean could have grabbed those himself. His was the only DNA found on the drawstring, specifically on the knot. But don't forget, Ramona and Jared are both active military. There were boxes and and bags full of cords, rope, and military-grade paracords all over the garage. Sean knew these things were there, so if he wanted to hang himself, why would he go through the trouble of using the helmet bag? The family also claimed several boots in their garage had loose laces, as if someone tried to remove them. Finally, Sean had his own drawstring gym bags in his bedroom. If he was so hell-bent on using one, why not use one of his own? If he dressed himself in Jared's clothes, why not grab a tie or something else from his closet? Next is his position when Maria found him. Sean was barefoot with his toes touching the ground. His glasses were also found broken in the grass. Ramona claims the bottoms of his feet were clean, which was strange. She says their backyard was muddy and swampy that day. If he walked barefoot, his feet would be covered in mud. Major Ron Montgomery of the Sheriff's Department refuted those claims in a video. He said images of the backyard from April 14th show it wasn't wet and muddy. Instead, it was dry and grassy. The family says Sean couldn't see a thing without his glasses. How could a clumsy, nearly blind 12-year-old climb up on a chair and hang himself on the swing? Then there's the issue of the chair itself. In photographs, you can see a black wicker chair near the slide and away from the swing set. There are claims on the Facebook page that police staged the scene in some way. In his statement, Major Montgomery said first responders moved the chair away from Sean's body so they could try and save him. It was originally located on the deck, but someone moved it under the swing swing, either Sean or Sean's killer. If an adult broke in and killed Sean, they probably wouldn't need a chair to reach the top of the swing set. But if Sean did hang himself, he'd likely need a boost. Among the most bizarre facts of the case is the belt holding his arms to his sides. Many wonder how he could have put the belt on himself. Here are a few possibilities. One could easily secure the belt around their waist, then shimmy their arms through. A child like Sean could also slip it over their head and wiggle it over their arms. Though unlikely, it is possible. It's also possible that someone killed Sean and bound his arms with the belt. But why? It seems like an odd way to stage a suicide. The family believes Sean's alarm went off at 3.30 to remind him about the trash. When Ramona got home, she found the kitchen bags had been removed and replaced, but Sean never took the trash out. His Crocs were also kicked off next to the bags, which was very strange. You see, Sean apparently had this weird thing about being barefoot. He always wore his shoes or Crocs inside. His bowl of canned peaches was untouched on the counter. Who fixes themselves a snack and then, out of nowhere, decides to end it all? Ramona claims they found torn trash bags with blue strings in the kitchen. Those were also out of place since she only buys the bags with red handles from Costco. You know, the ones that come with a million in one box? When they went upstairs, they discovered the thermostat had been set to 85 degrees. Now, this is Southern Virginia in mid-April. There's no reason why the thermostat should have been that high. Someone must have touched it. 
but who? The sheriff's office has not commented on the out-of-place garbage bags or the thermostat. In Ramona and Jared's bedroom, they found Sean's underwear on the floor. Now, this would make sense if Sean voluntarily changed into Jared's clothes and underpants. But Ramona and Jared feared the worst. They think whoever killed Sean sexually assaulted him first. According to Major Montgomery and the ME's report, there were no signs of sexual assault on Sean's body. The Facebook page posted CCTV footage of a man walking down the street in the middle of the night. It was captioned, is a killer out there? But the timestamp on the video is dated May 16th, a month after Sean's death. On May 20th, 2022, the sheriff's department returned to the home per the family's quest. During that visit, Ramona pointed out a red stain on the upstairs wall. But upon reviewing photos from April 14th, images of that same wall do not show a red stain. There's also debate about what the two-year-old did or did not see that day. According to Ramona, he said there was a friend chasing Sean around the home and punching him. The child claims the man touched his arm too. When Ramona found him hiding under the clothes, she said he looked like an exhausted doll. He was sweating as if he'd been crying. She thinks he woke up during the attack and witnessed someone kill his older brother. Major Montgomery pushed back on that angle. According to him, Ramona gave a recorded statement on the 14th saying the two-year-old was asleep when she left. When she returned, she's quoted as saying, thank God he was still asleep. But could this be semantics? A shaken mother just saying the first thing that comes to mind? Are there pieces of this, quote, recorded statement we aren't hearing? In a video posted to the Facebook page, Ramona claims the sheriff's department washed blood off Sean's body. Major Montgomery says that's simply untrue. When the family returned home, they noticed a big handprint on the inside of a glass door. It was too big to be one of theirs. It also left a residue or film on the door. According to the family, an investigator said they got good prints off the mystery hand, but they didn't match anything in the database. They returned for more prints a month later, but there was nothing viable to test. The family doesn't believe the initial handprint was ever sent in for testing. They also don't know what happened to Sean's underwear after they showed them to the police. The community, believing the police weren't helping, banded together to help Sean's family. They received a screenshot taken at 4.36 p.m. on April 14th, about 13 minutes before Maria got home. It shows a landscaping truck parked across the street from their home. The family asked the neighbor for the full video, but they allegedly refused to turn it over. According to Sean's friends, teachers, and family, he was a happy-go-lucky kid with plenty to look forward to. According to the sheriff's department, this little boy walked into the backyard on April 14th, 2022, and hanged himself. Some of the facts are baffling, like the blue string trash bags, the handprint, and Sean's crocs in the kitchen. Can you rely on the word of a two-year-old claiming a man chased Sean through the house punching him? Some of Ramona's claims don't line up with the investigation, like the muddy, swampy backyard and the red spot on the wall. The police will withhold information and even put out false information during an active investigation. We saw this with the Brian Koberger case and the roommate, who everyone believed slept through the quadruple murder. This was a misdirection to keep the roommate safe since she allegedly saw Koberger's face that night. Does the sheriff's department have a suspect in mind? Are they riding the suicide angle to see if they can shake his killer loose? Or did a 12-year old boy tragically take his own life on that April day in 2022. What do you think happened? And that's your recap. Thanks for hanging out with us today. If you like getting all the crime in half the time, go ahead and tap that subscribe button and the bell so you never miss a story. We're here Wednesdays, Saturdays, and Sundays, but don't go away. Catch up on more recaps right here, right now. Until next time, take care.